No, creo que... Ingo, you launch it, eh? You launch the camera or is... I, I asked him to do it. Ah, they do the it. So. Ah, it's already on. So oh. we, we're going to start whenever you want. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody attending this uh, first uh, se season of uh, Seminar of Mobile in New York Times. Uh, I want to uh, give a warm welcome especially to our uh, virtual assistant <laughs> to this uh, meeting. And I want to recall you that at the end of this talk, uh, there will be a round of open, for open questions, remarks, and comments. Uh, the, the, you know, our first, uh, the speaker of today is uh, Professor Claudio Estrella de Milazzo. He's full professor at the physics department at the University of uh, Illes Balears. Uh, uh, he's also a member of the ISC, and uh, he has, uh, uh, he's author or co-author for over more, for more for over uh, for uh, over 180 publications, perhaps more or less. More or less. <laughs> and his research lines are uh, mainly devoted to dynamics of the coupled systems, information processing in multiple time and spatial scales, by a neuro inspired devices, modeling of neuronal systems, dynamics and synchronization of semiconductor lasers, and chaos based optical communications. Uh, he has coordinated and also, or have been uh, the principal investigator of many projects. Among them, I, w I wish to mention here the Occult, Focus, Picasso, and Geiba. Mm -hmm. uh, he will give us the talk entitled uh, Anticipated Synchronization in Neural uh, Circuits. Uh, when you wish, Professor. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be the first uh, speaker in this new concept of seminar or series of seminar that we have uh, together with the people from the, department, the mathematical department here at the UIB with the participation of people in UK, in France, and also in Barcelona. So they are online watching it, and at the end, as we say before, they, they, will, see, they, will, they will be able to ask questions through Skype. Uh, well, my idea is to start uh, talking today about this uh, anticipated synchronization phenomena. I will concentrate more in the neuronal system, but the idea is to give you first a general, uh, a general review of, uh, in particular, what we have done here, but also what other people have been doing in this, in this topic. So when we talk about anticipation, we mean if we can predict the future. Can we predict or anticipate what's going to happen? That's why what anticipated synchronization aims to. But there is a second point which is more or less similar which would be, can we gain time for taking decisions? This is in terms of the brain. Can we have more time to take decisions that we usually have due to the, the propagation of the signals in the brain? So if we talk about anticipated or prediction, prediction of the future, there are several ways you can do that. You can either call someone that if you pay some money, you will get some response about your future. Either you trust her or not, that's your problem. Certainly, you can ask someone else. You can, you can ask a scientist. If you ask the scientist, can you predict me the future? He will probably say, if you give me the equation of motion and the initial conditions, of course I can. And that is true for some kind of system which are not, let's say, or that simple system or that periodic system, systems that are not very complicated or complex. For instance, we can say that the a total eclipse will occur in April 18th, 2024. And we know that this is a very, very much prediction. Will be visible in North America. So that we know, eight years in advance. However, there are many other systems that we cannot predict so easily. For instance, chaotic system. If we deal with fast, varying, even chaotic, dynamical systems, and the, con the initial conditions are not very well known, predicting this is very complicated. In the year 2000, Henning Voss, which is a German scientist, proposed a novel method to predict, the, to predict the response of a dynamical system, and he does that based on auxiliary system. What is interesting is that the prediction is done in real time. So I can predict the future of a system in some conditions in real time, anticipating the evolution of the system of interest. We will enter into detail later. But just to recall some of you, most of you are already uh, familiarized with the synchronization aspect. If we have two systems, X and Y, that are ruled by the same function F in both, 
And if I talk, I have the evolution of the variable x, which is a function of x. The evolution of uh, variable y is, uh, they say, the same function f of y. And if I couple them with this diffusive coupling, there is this potential solution, x of t equal to y of t, which is a solution of the system, that in some circumstances is stable. And it is stable for large enough coupling strength. So if I have a large enough kappa, then this system will synchronize. And this is true even for chaotic systems. But with this, I'm not anticipating anything. I'm just telling that two systems can synchronize at the same time. What was discovered was a new scheme, which was really not new. It is a, the well-known lag synchronization. But he give, gave to it a different flavor. Because he started to talk about anticipated synchronization. And anticipated synchronization refers to the case in which the slave system which was represented before by the Y system, predicts the dynamics of the master system. This is what he proposed in, the Sosan, in 2000. And he also talked about two potential or possible schemes for the anticipated synchronization to occur. The first one is called complete replacement. So I have the X system. I have the Y system. These are two uh, exponentially decay systems eh, in the absence of any perturbation, they decay to a steady state exponentially, or to zero in this case. But, but if I add here a delay, f of x of t minus tau, I have a delay feedback here, nonlinear one. And if I couple the same function into this one, the system can synchronize anticipatory. I will show you in a moment. The second scheme, which is more, in, more interesting for, for us, is which is called delayed coupling. I have this system that, in principle, is autonomous system, the, uh, which is described by this function f. The system Y is also described by the same function F, but is coupled to X directly, but has a self-feedback negative loop. So the systems are different, but the results are the same. And the results are, if F of X is a function which defines the autonomous dynamic of the system under consideration, in both the scheme, the solution Y of T equal X of T plus tau is a solution of the equation. And both show that this solution can be structurally stable, which means that the slave is doing what the master is going to do in the future. How much in the future? A time to. This is the anticipation. This is more remarkable when the dynamic of the system X is unpredictable. This can also occur in chaotic systems. Certainly, there are restrictions in the complete replacement scheme, which is the one that is less important or less interesting for us. A tau can be arbitrarily large, as has been shown in, in many papers, while in the delay coupling regime, which is the one I'm interested on, the coupling scheme needs to satisfy some conditions, both in the delay time and in the coupling strength. But I will go into details in the next slides. So the idea, the simple idea is the following. This is the typical situation we expect. If I have A connected to B, what I expect is this situation. If A does something, B will go, is going to do the same if they are synchronized after A. However, the synchronized, synchronized, the synchronized, the anticipated synchronization is different. This connects this, but this one evolves in time before this and that. So the receiving population is predicting what the emitter population is doing in the future, or is going to do in the future. I will show you some examples that were presented by Vos at the beginning where this happens. This is simple, the Ikeda equation. This is the equation describing the Ikeda system, which contains, uh, you see here is a, a nonlinear feedback term. And here I have an injection of the same function into the, into the Y, which is the, the complete replacement scheme, the first one I talk about. And here is the evolution of the slave, which is the in dot line, and the evolution of the master, which is in continuous line. So if I properly shift one series with respect to the other, I find a one correlation between x and y. And if you see here, the slave system is doing the dynamics of the master system in the future. So the slave is anticipating what the master is going to do in the future. Then he proved that in electronic circuits. So you see here, it is not perfect, certainly because the function ruling the two systems are not identical. Because if, I, if I'm using real systems, resistance are not the same, etc. But still, the synchronization is very good, and it is anticipated. Then it came many other uh, systems in which this was studied. First, numerically in coupled lasers. 
This is one laser subject to feedback, which is coupled into a second laser. And you see this is the master evolution, and this is the slave evolution, which anticipates the master one. And then it was proven experimentally in 2002, again getting anticipated synchronization very clearly in, an, in a real system, in a real experimental system. At that time, we started with Raul, who is here. We started to think, what would happen if we have non-autonomous system? Because all this dynamics is for autonomous system. If the system is autonomous, this, this, the solution can be identical. X of t, x, y of t equal to x of t plus tau is a solution. But if the system is not autonomous, that is not the case, usually. It's not the case. So we say, not only that situation, but let's try to take some models of neurons. And at that time, we, know, we knew nothing about neurons, so we took the first model we found, which was the Fitzgunagumo model. And the Fitzgunagumo model is, is quite used to describe the evolution of neurons in, the, in mathematical terms. So we took the two equations. These are only nonlinear eh? equations describing the evolution of neuron one. One is, this, one is related to the membrane potential of the neuron. The other is related to the, to the ionic currents of the neuron. And this is the evolution of the neuron two, which is coupled to one, and is subject to a delay feedback. So this is the situation. This is my master neuron. This is my slave neuron. Master coupled to the slave. The slave have a negative cell feedback. And both are subject to an external stimulus. At the beginning, we put the same to both, and we put a noise. A noise term. So both neurons are subject to the same noise term. And if you see here the results, at very low coupling values, this is the coupling strength, kappa. This is the delay time, tau. You see, for very low kappa, they both synchronize identically, and that is because they are subject to the same noise. But if I increase kappa, I got a ratio of uh, almost one, correlation one, between the anticipated solution of the slave with respect to the anticipated solution with respect to the solution of the master, although this is not an autonomous system. Black means, means black high correlation, which means in all this region I get a correlation which is above 99, 0.99 for the corre uh, correlation coefficient, let's say. A couple of years ago, we decided to start a more complicated system. So we took a complex Imundalao equation, which is just a one-dimensional version of it. This is a more complex system. It contains the time derivative of a complex field. It contains a second derivative in space. It has a nonlinear term. These parameters, alpha 1 and alpha 2, are complex. And the solution of the system is a plane wave, which is represented here. I'm, I'm not going to enter into details. The plane wave in the Fourier space of a wavelength k or wave, wave vector k, uh, um, q, has this solution. And all plane waves become unstable for epsilon equal to 1 and c1 times c, c, c2 equal to minus 1. Don't worry much. What we have to know is that there are chaotic regimes. And they are very different chaotic regimes. The most chaotic one is the defect turbulence one. Here you see the correlation function. How it, how it decays, the correlation in, in space and time. This is the phase turbulence regime, which is a slightly less chaotic. And this is the big chaos regime, which is a slightly less chaotic. So we, we are in the presence of a chaotic uh, spatiotemporal system. Now I will couple my system into the second one, as we do always. A coupling, the same variable A, and the delay version of B. And this is what we get. This is a, a space and time representation of the dynamics of the system in the defect turbulence scene. So you see these are turbulent behavior. But if you see here, this is the slave and this is the master. And they are identical, except there is a shift in time. The slave is doing before the master does the spatiotemporal dynamics. By changing the coupling parameters, you see that there is some regions in which, as happened for the Fitzgunagumo neurons, in which correlation is high. And depending on the coupling strength, actually here we used a complex coupling strength. For different coupling strengths, I can have a larger synchronization region or slower or smaller. So even for chaotic spatiotemporal system, we can get anticipated synchronization. And the question is now, can we translate this idea of anticipated synchronization based on a delay coupled system into a neuronal system? Well, to start with, neurons are not oscillators, are, are excitable systems. 
And also, these kind of delays are not very common in the neuronal system. What is very common is a, a microcircuit composed by an excitatory neuron, an excitatory neuron, and an inhibitory neuron, which we call interneuron. This is very typical in neuroscience. So we have excitation or excitable system, ex, uh, ex, excitation here between this and this, and inhibition between this and this. So this is what we propose as equivalent to the anticipated synchronization uh, scheme I showed before. To study this system, we use the Hodgkin and Huxley equation that I will not enter into detail. Some of you already know it. But the, it has an equation for the evolution of the membrane potential of the, of the neuron. It contains one term which is related to the uh, ionic current related to sodium the ionic current related to the potassium, and there is an extra current, which is a liquid current here. It has some external current, and it might have some connection with other neurons. So this is the system. The currents and connection with, other, with the external source or with other neurons. Certainly, the neurons do not connect directly, as we showed before with diffusive coupling. Most of the neurons connect using chemical synapses. And chemical synapses can be described in terms of this uh, first order nonlinear equation, which contains two terms. This, this main term here is related to the, uh, R is related to the fraction of bound synaptic receptors. That means how many receptors bound to the postsynaptic channel. And alpha, this function here, accounts for the number of neurotransmitters I release in the connection. So I have to release neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter has to bound to the postsynaptic channel, to open channel, and allow current to flow. This is the idea. If I have an excitatory neuron, I open channel of sodium and I reduce the firing threshold of the neuron. I make it more excitable. If I, if I use inhibitory neurons, which is GABA, for instance, I increase the firing threshold, which means I put the threshold farther from the excitation, so I try the neuron not to fire. One is excitatory, one is inhibitory. This is the, the interplay between the neurons in the brain. So let me show you some simulation we had. This is the system. We subject, initially, we subject all the neurons to the same external current, which in this case is 280 picoamperes. Doesn't matter much. We chose this excitatory coupling fix to 10 nanosiemens, and we varied this inhibitory coupling here, which is the effect of this inhibitory neuron into the slave population. And this is a typical situation. We choose um, this uh, inhibitory coupling 20 nanosiemens, and this is what you expect. If you generate a pulse here, you will generate a pulse here and then here. This is the typical situation one expects. However, if I increase the inhibitory connection, what happens is that the slave neuron pulses before the master neuron does. And that is because of the inhibition induced by the interneuron. It is periodic. It is periodic oscillation. No. All of them are in the periodic regime, but depending on the coupling strength of the inhibition, they can lock in, let's say, a kind of positive phase lock or negative phase lock. I would call this positive phase lock and this negative phase lock. Ne next figure will help to understand that. If I'm changing the GABA, which is the inhibitory connection here, I have here master slave. This is delay synchronization. And as I increase the GABA conductance, for instance, for this particular uh, excitatory conductance, I have a transition, a continuous transition from delay to anticipated synchronization, which means that I'm really anticipating. It's not that one is shifting so much that I don't see. I don't have any jump here. I have a continuous transition from delay, the, the interne the the slave neuron is moving the potential until it crosses and anticipates or have a negative phase with respect to the master. Okay? And depending on the, on the GABA conductance, I have different curves, also for different input current, I have different figures, but all, the same have the same, all of them have the same behavior. There is a clear transition from delay to anticipated synchronization. Actually, if we plot in the uh, excitatory coupling, inhibitory coupling phase space, I have a quite big region of delay synchronization. I have a quite big region of anticipated synchronization. 
And I have a region of, fi of phase drift in which there is no locking between the, the, the oscillation of the, of the two neurons. And this is robust against external current, decay constant in the synapses, the driver neuron, etc. But certainly, if you want to convince neuroscientists that this is, might be important for them, you cannot show them just three couple neurons. So we decided to study neuronal populations. And for that, what we did is we took as a master system a population, I think they were 1,000 neurons or 500 neurons, having 80% excitatory neurons, 20% inhibitory neurons. And we couple excitatory because it is known that most of the long range connections in the brain are excitatory. So we couple excitatory to one a slave population which only contains excitatory neurons for the moment. And we have an interneuron population which only contains inhibitory neurons. This, there are some cases, and I will show you later in the primary visual cortex, that this occurs. There are populations of only excitatory neurons and populations of only inhibitory neurons, although it's not the most common case. Usually we have a mix of them. But this is very similar to what we did before. Something which is projecting excitatory coupling to this intermediate neuron, and it comes back some inhibition. To study, we use the Iskevich model just because computationally is, is uh, simpler than the, than the Hodgkin and Huxley. This is the main brain potential evolution. Here it contains the coupling with the other neurons. This, is the, this variable is related to the ionic current, in particular to the slow potassium uh, movement. It's just a nonlinear, two-dimensional nonlinear uh, equations with a reset term. If the voltage go, uh, reaches 30 millivolt, the variable V is reset to a parameter C, the variable U is reset to a parameter U plus T. We took the synapses mediated by AMPA, which is the excitatory, and GABA A, which is the inhibitory one. We took short range corrections, both excitatory and inhibitory, long range connections. Here are only inhibitory, here are only, uh, sorry, here are only excitatory, from there are only inhibitory. We include neuronal diversity, which means not all the neurons were identical, we put the differences into the parameters. And finally, we subject each neuron to an independent Poisson input. So we make it very complicated for the system to synchronize. Still, I will show you in terms of raster plot, a raster plot is just a plot in which once a neuron makes a pulse, I put a dot. So this is the number of neurons. We have 500 neurons in the population. Every time neurons one does a, does a pulse, I put a, a, plot, a point here, and then one, and then another. And these are the 500 neurons that are pulsing. This is for the master population. This is for the slave population. And this is for the interneuron population. And if you see here, this is for a certain connectivity, master slave, and a certain connectivity, interneuron slave, that the master is slightly before the slave. I'm not including any delay in the connection. So if the, if the master anticipates, it will anticipate just a little. Hmm? However, if I change the inhibition, now I have to reduce it in this case. You clearly see that now the slave system is anticipating the dynamics of the master. You can see it better here. This is the evolution of the local field potential, which is here is the mean membrane potential of the master and the slave. And if you see, the master is slightly advanced with respect to the slave. This is the normal delay synchronization. However, if I change the, the inhibitory conductance, I clearly see that the slave pulses before the population of the master does. Certainly, if you see here, until the, cross until the crossing here, the, let's say the voltage of the master is higher or is larger than the voltage of the slave. And the slave is already feeling something. So it's not that the slave pulses by itself. It's also feeling some information coming from the master. Because if not, it could never anticipate it. So in this part, the slave system is receiving some information for the, from the master. But at the peak of the activity of the population, the, master is, the slave is anticipating. If we plot in the, the delay time as a function of the, initi of the inhibitory con uh, connection, for different or for a fixed master slave conductivity, we see that we have an anticipated synchronization regime, and then we have a delayed synchronization regime. We can change the excitatory connectivity and see delay, anticipated delay. So 
there is an interplay between excitation and inhibition that allows me to get different regimes of delay or anticipated synchronization. Again, if I plot in the excitatory inhibitory coupling phase space, I will see a nice region of anticipated synchronization and a large region of delay synchronization, as expected. OK, this for us was very interesting. And at that time, we were writing the uh, paper. And we, we thought, is there any experimental evidence for that? And at that time, we didn't know it. But we found two papers from the group of Steve Bressler in, in the United States. One was a PNAS paper of 2004, which was called Beta Oscillation in Enlarged Scale Sensory Motor Cortical Network, Directional Influence Revealed by, revealed by Granger Causality. So what they were measuring is beta is, a, is about, I don't remember exactly, 12, 13 hertz or something like that. It's one of these oscillations in the brain. And they were checking how this oscillation synchronized and how the information flows in that network. Because that's what Granger causality reveals, how the information flows. Some years later, in 2012, they plot a similar paper, but in another uh, task. This was a working memory task, and this was in science, in which they found similar results. But I will concentrate more on this one, because we got their data to analyze it. The idea was the following. They were looking for the functional relations of the synchronization in the beta band of neuronal assembling in the pre and post central area of monkeys, doing a task in which they had to press, uh, they had pressed a lever and they had to release it in, to in front of a stimulus. So the monkey is waiting until the stimulus appears. Right? When the stimulus appears, they have to release the lever. The fastest they do, they get the rewards. If they do too slow, they don't get the rewards. So they are waiting to do that. So they are prepared for the task. So this is called a go-no-go -go visual pattern discrimination task. And what was interesting is that they measured two quantities. One is the power and coherent spectral analysis of the, of the, of the series. This is this local field potential. This is a, a neurophysiological time series obtained with, uh, with electrodes. And this uh, power and coherence were used to identify the synchronization. And they use, as I said before, Granger causality to study how the information flows in this network. And they gave some numbers. The width of the connection will represent how coherent the oscillations are and how does the information flow. So here you have the main results they have. With the coherence, you can not only get the strength of the connection, but also the delay time in the activation. So you can guess how these, for instance, two population activates which activates before and which activates later. And with the Granger causality, you will know how the information is flowing. For instance, here it's going from 3 to 4. These are two different measurements. So interestingly, they say that many times they found positive Granger causality and negative delay time, which means, for instance, between 3 and 4. They were sure that the information was flowing from 3 to 4, but the activation time revealed that 4 activated before 3. What did they say? Well, Granger causality were generally inconsistent with time delay values derived from phase spectra because the sign of the time delay did not predict the direction of the Granger causality. And they conclude that relative phase is not a reliable index of neural and influence, which is true. But that doesn't mean that those two results are contradictory. So at that time, we, entered, we, we contacted them and, and offered, in particular, Steve Bressler to participate with us in the paper. We told them the story of the anticipated synchronization. He was very interested from the beginning. And they sent us the data. So we reanalyzed their data and obtained certainly the same values they obtained. But we also found, for instance, we could plot, eh, let's say, all the directions, the red direction is positive Granger causality and negative phase time or negative lag time. The blue one is positive Granger causality with the flow, uh, with, the, with the delay time in the same direction. So this is the typical we expect. If I send something, it has, there it has to occur after I send it. And there were some situations that were bidirectional, but always there is one direction that dominates. 
So this is the data we had. And we decided to study this, in particular, this circuit, 2 to 1, because this is clearly a situation in which there is a flow from 2 to 1, and there is uh, this one uh, uh, pulses before the 2 does. So this is a clear example of anticipated synchronization. So to, to study this, we had already the idea how to, how to tackle this problem, but now we simplify the idea of the three population into two. Why? Because we know that in the cortex, most of the population contain excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So what we did is, well, instead of having a two population here, I will, we will consider two. One subpopulation of excitatory neuron, one subpopulation of inhibitory neuron. And I'm going to play with the connectivity between inhibition and excitation. I can change. I will change that value and see what happens. And this is the scheme we studied before. Certainly, we have to adapt our numerical data, data to, the, to the experimental one in terms of uh, downsampling, in terms of noise there, and so on. So this is the scheme we are going to, show, I'm going to show you, and this is the experimental result. This is the time series. You don't see anything, me either. Here, at and, and, and the naked age, you don't see any difference between the two. You cannot guess anything. But if you do the coherence, you initially find a clear peak. This peak indicates the, the frequency at which the population oscillates, but also gives information about the delay time. This is the Granger causality. We have a peak in black, which indicates that the, that this, the information goes from 2 to 1, while we don't have or we hardly have any peak from 1 to 2, which means there is nothing coming from 1 to 2. So this is a clear one-directional situation. And this is our uh, numerical result. This is the time series, which is, looks similar to the other one. This is our coherent spectra, which has a peak, which has a peak at 24 hertz. As in the experiment, well, we, match, we play with the parameter to get it. Eh? And this is the, the Granger causality which has to be like this, because we are imposing this in the model. We are imposing that the, that the connectivity is from A to B. So we need a peak from master to slave. If a peak appears from a slave to master, there is something wrong there. So it is clear that there is a peak from master to slave, and there is almost nothing from the slave to master. And the delay time we get is almost the same they get in the experiment, minus 8.2 microseconds. Although we are not imposing any delay in the communication. They are, the populations are coupled instantaneously. This happens because of the inhibition and or the, the interplay between in, in inhibition and excitation. So the numbers match very well, certainly by playing with parameters, but since we have the model, we can do more than them. We can play with different oscillation frequency for the population. For instance, this is 7 hertz, was our first study. This is uh, 17 hertz. This is the uh, science paper of the monkeys. And this is 24 hertz, which is the PNAS papers of the monkeys. And if you see here, we always get a region of anticipating and delay. In this case, this red dot corresponds to the experimental value. The green marks correspond to the delay, to the numerical results. We find windows of anticipated synchronization here and windows of delay synchronization, as in the experiment. And even if we see the science paper with other oscillating frequency, we also find by changing the inhibition and fixing the excitation, a window for anticipated synchronization in this system. Which means that this might be a mechanism that is present in the brain that makes some populations or some areas in the cortex to anticipate the behavior of, the other, of others. There is, a second, there is a second result that we found uh, more recently, and it's related to the, to the CAD primary visual cortex. Uh, I'm, not an expert, I'm not an expert at all. Not on the other one, but less in this one about the visual cortex. But this was done, an experiment done by Luis Martinez in the Instituto de Neurociencia de Alicante in Spain. He was recording in relay cell, which is a group of cells that are in what is called the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is at the end of the, of the, of the, of the cells coming from the retina. It's about here. They were performing recordings in, in anesthetized cuts. The retina output reaches the primary visual cortex through some cells, which are called relay cells, which are located in the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So from the retina, it goes to the thalamus, but not to the central thalamus, but to another region of the thalamus. Interestingly, it was suggested, or this is what uh, 
Lewis says, that the anatomical organization of relay cells and the interneurons, because part of the geniculine nucleus contains excitatory populations and inhibitory populations, oops, boost contrast borders. So it is important to improve the contrast between borders and increase the dynamic range of the visual stimuli. So they play an important role. But more interestingly for us, it was that when recording in relay cells, and I will show you now the, the circuit, they found a slightly smaller, in average, delay time for the inhibitory postsynaptic potential, means inhibition, arriving from the retina through the interneurons, than the excitation that arrives directly from the retina. Let me show you the circuit. This is the simplest circuit we can draw. This is the retina. This is the information from the retina goes to the relay cell, but also goes to the this nucleus of the lateral genicular nucleus, which is inhibitory. And what they say is that the information that arrives here arrives later than the information that arrives here. Although this is a, a, a desynaptic case. So it, you have a synapsis here, you have a second synapsis here. The delay time is comparable, but still information here arrives before this one. And this is shown here in this graph where we have the inhibitory latency, which will be related to this time, an excitatory latency, which will be related to this time. One is this, the other one is this. And you see that here is slightly smaller. So the time it takes information to go through this path is smaller than going directly there. So we thought this would be, again, a case of anticipated synchronization, although the circuit is different. But let's see how is the, the, oh, sorry. How is the, the, the visual cortex. Well, from the retina, you go to these relay cells. You have also some interneurons there. There are some other interneurons here that seems to be not very important, at least what he thought at that time. And then they go to the, to the layers 4 and layer 6 into the cortex. But all the, the important information we are talking about is here. So this is the circuit I showed you before. Retina, relay cells, retina, interneurons, interneuron, relay cells. Certainly, this is more complicated. But with this simple circuit, with these simulations, in our model. And what we found is, independently of the inhibition here, we always get delay synchronization. So always in our case, this pulse arrives before this one, which is opposite to what they found in the experiment. So we, we say, well, this is because, as it is the circuit, this is not anticipated synchronization in our case. So there might be something else that you are not taking into account. And that something else might be this uh, I don't know the name, no record, I don't recall the name. It's, uh, it's, it's another reticular nucleus here which is connected to, this, to the relay cells. You see here, there is another connection. So the true circuit is now this one. The retina goes to the relay cell. The retina goes to this interneuron. It goes here, but it's also connected by a bidirectional excitatory inhibitory loop to this TRN nucleus. And this is also connected to the LGN, but this is not important. So the circuit is slightly more complicated. But if you forget about this, what we have is the anticipated synchronization circuit. So we did simulations. And if you do simulation for a small inhibition here, we took the same values here and here, just to simplify it. We get delay synchronization. But as soon as we increase the inhibition here and here, we get anticipated synchronization. And it is interesting to see that there are two peaks here. The first peak corresponds to this circuit. And the second peak here corresponds to this one, which is always delay. If you see here, this one is always more or less delay or at the same time with the, with the one coming here. But the one that gives the anticipation is through this other nucleus that he did not consider. So with the, with the model, in principle, we help him to understand that there might be another circuit that is participating in, the, in, the, in this uh, thalamus part that is giving rise to these different delays in, this, in the circuit. Certainly, we can play with the model. By changing the inhibition, we see that we pass from, ex, from a delay synchronization to an anticipated synchronization. These are done. We have error bars for different simulations. We have noise. We have everything. So we try to do it seriously. And this is the data compared from the experiment and the, and the modeling. Here are the experimental results. This is the zero delay. 
And the, the mean value is at negative values, which indicate that there is experimentally they observe anticipated synchronization. And this is what we get. We can give, the, we can find the same average value for this value of the inhibitory connection. Certainly, we have some longer delays here that seems not to appear in the experiment, but I think it's just a matter of playing with parameters. I think we can reduce this and put more delays quite here. But it seems that the model is able to explain, at least qualitatively, what happens in the experiment. Uh, just to finish, I, I will speculate if there is any uh, functional uh, role of this, uh, of this anticipated synchronization. Certainly, we don't have any idea. You have to realize we are physicists, so we, don't know, we, have not, we know nothing about how the brain works. Very, very little. But still, we can, we can uh, think about what might happen. And, and uh, if it works, yeah. And you see, there are some places in which you are really anticipating the movement. And people know that the brain does that. The question is how it does that. Is it because it's trained? Certainly, it is because it's trained. This is a second example. We will never be able to get that ball at the speed it comes. We don't have a, such a reaction time. But the reaction time is something that you only train, or it only, there is also some uh, changes in the connectivity between the brain that allows you to anticipate the behavior. At the end, anticipa anticipated synchronization means that you shorten your reaction. You make it shorter. That, that's what anticipated synchronization means in terms of the brain. There is another possibility, completely different idea, and this is related to the Hebbian rules. Uh, the Hebbian rules are the rules of uh, spike time dependent plasticity. And the idea is that you have two neurons that pulse one pulse and then the other, one pulse and then the other. The connection between the two is increased. But if you have the situation that did this pulse before this one, the connection decreases. So you try to cut that connection because it is acronus. It goes against the normal time. This is the Hebbian rule. So I would say that delay synchronization reinforce the connectivity between some neurons because it's one and then the other. One, then the other, the connectivity increases. And anticipated synchronization, what will do is to reduce the connectivity between some neurons. So what it's really doing is, is cutting connection. It's erasing connectivity between some neurons. And it is known that during the sleep, the brain does that. It has to remove some memories that are useless for it. So memories were already created very weakly, but they might be created already. So if you want to weaken them more, a mechanism as the anticipated synchronization one would help you to reduce that connectivity and probably erase that memory. This is completely speculative, so don't believe me too much. But that is what we understand, at least from here. So just to summarize and finishing, I think I show you that anticipated synchronization can occur in simple system, in chaotic system, in high, dimens high dimensional system, and even in an excitatory inhibitory loop without including an, explicitly, an explicit delay time as uh, Henning Voss uh, includes. In principle, the strength of inhibition regulate the change between delay and anticipated synchronization, although it is the interplay between excitation and inhibition that makes this transition to occur. There are experimental observations that were reproduced with the model, for instance, in monkeys, cortex, a, a negative delay time with positive range of causality was experimentally observed, and we proved that it might happen also in, in our models. In the cat primary visual cortex, a shorter time lag between the retina and relay cells was found through a desynaptic pathway with respect to the direct connection between retina and relay cells. Finally, even if the delay time in the connection is assumed, the synchronization time can be smaller than the connection time. And this is an important point because I'm not assuming any delay in the connection, which is not true. But if I assume a certain delay, since anticipated synchronization occurred, the delay, the, the connection time between the two is shorter than the connection time if delay if anticipated synchronization does not occur. Did you follow it? I mean, it's subtle, but I think that's the idea. Even if I include delays, the total delay is shorter when there is anticipated synchronization when, than when the, 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 there is not. That's why I say that you are gaining time to take decision because the connection time between your neurons is shorter, so you can gain time to take decision. 
The functional significance of anticipated synchronization or even uh, delayed synchronization for us is not clear at all, and I don't think people know yet why this exactly occurs, but I think it is worth to, to see why it happens. Finally, let me thank uh, my collaborator, Steve Bressler, in, uh, in the Complex System and Brain Science Center in Florida, Pedro Carelli in the Department of Physics in Brazil, in, uh, in Recife, Marcena Sisak, which is in, in Florence, Mauro Copelli, which is in, in Recife again, Luis Martinez in Alicante, Fernanda Matia in Universidad Federal de Agoas, and Katy Mayol and Raúl Toraz here from IFISC. So that's all. Thank you very much. Inténtalo. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, no. It will come. Está puesto, está puesto, pero. Está puesto. Está todo en orden, creo. No, no. Manuel. Hi? Hi. No. Someone actually tried to recall correctly, Professor Chua, the information in the latest many years ago, the economic. It's something that uh, at the time was quite paradoxical. Is that so? Do you consider that neurons can operate at a time scale to be milliseconds? Order of milliseconds, yeah. Yeah, actually, once I try to see, and, and there are a, a lot about this anticipation on the brain. Actually, there are people that go through completely, go through completely different lines, and they are also studying this fast reaction time that many people have, and how to train that, because people playing tennis need that for instance. Uh, but th those mechanisms are completely different. But I don't, it might be possible, I fully agree with you, but I don't know that people are still convinced which are those mechanisms that maybe it's a mix of different mechanisms, most probably. And uh, we are, certainly we are not saying, we don't have the right to say that, that anticipated synchronization is relevant in the brain. We don't know. We find it in the model. There seems to be indication that it occurs in some neuronal systems. Now the point is we have to look, or someone experimentally should look in more detail if this happened, why this happened, in which situation can you train this, for instance. We think that a very interesting experiment with rat or any is just to do some, some of these kind of, of uh, test, tasks and check before they learn to do the task how the synchronization is and after the task to see if you pass from delay to anticipate synchronization or not in the same circuit. That, that is something that it could, could be done by recording, for instance, the rats before the, 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 before the experiment, or before doing the task and while training and after. And then you will see if this really happens or not. Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe it has nothing to do with that. Yes? Do you expect higher error rates if you're not Yes. Actually, we don't understand very well why. Ah, you, you say error rate. Sorry. No, no, no. Error rate. Uh, Could be. Uh, actually, we st Raul, we study the, the errors in, as a function of the coupling and the delay time, and we studied that in the past. I don't remember. It might be possible, yes. It might be possible that, that, the, that the number of errors increases. There is uh, some parameters in which it's optimal, but then if you depart from there, certainly it increases. I, am, I thought that you were asking about the frequency, the oscillating frequency. And what we know is that when you couple an excitatory and inhibitory neuron, the oscillation increases, and that helps anticipate this synchronization to occur. But uh, it was a different question. Yes?
mechanism are related or, or, or not? The first mechanism is the one, the, the, the boss one, which the coupling makes the, the, the two systems finally to go to the same attractor. And then it happens that, okay, by putting parameters, they can be flying in the same attractor, one before the other or the other. So it just, this happens in autonomous systems. Mm -hmm. Without any external stimulus, the dynamics of the coupling between them brings them to the same place. And then uh, we have phase where the tension. The other is when you have uh, spikes or pulses just produced by, by external stimulants that can be noise. Then you, you have shown an example of this in that it's essentially that one of the systems, one of the neurons, has a higher gain, so it responds, uh, even if it receives the stimulus later, it responds faster, so it can uh, take the, the response before the one that is receiving the stimulus before. Mm. Uh, it, are the two mechanisms the same? Are related? Are completely different? I guess they are similar. And actually, Raul showed in a paper some years ago with Salvador and Marcena, that in the simplest case, with a very simple model, what you find is that there is a reduction in the threshold of the, of the slave system due to the feedback. So if you have a feedback, the, the threshold uh, there is a re threshold reduction, so a, a small perturbation already makes the slave to pulse, which means it, can, it could pulse before the master, because the master is already sending information. So a small information arriving from the master makes the slave to pulse. That's why it's faster. That is a threshold reduction, which I think is the second scheme you show, you talked about. But I think that both have to happen because they must be in the same, moving in the same attractor, I guess, because the synchronization but seems the, to be the stable. Have, the, 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 the second case, if you don't have the stimulus, there is no oscillation. The neuron is at the best. It's not possible. It's not high. Well, in, uh, I mean, what we tried, no. You are right. The neurons are, are uh, sub-threshold without any connection with anybody. Certainly, they are connected among them, but they are receiving external noise from other neurons that are not in the model. And that's what you try to model with the Poisson train. There are some other neurons that you are not considering in the model that are affecting that one. So you put noise sources. And that, that noise sources make the system to spike. Since the noise are independent, if you don't connect them, this is a noise is spiking. Once you connect, they, they organize into, a, into an oscillation. This is quite accepted, at least in, in, in computational neuroscience. Okay, thank you.